Christian church unknowingly that we need to know who our Father is. Now let's look at Luke 18, 18, where this rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he makes a statement, and Jesus corrects him very adamantly about it. And remember that he's a rich young ruler. That means he ruled over the people. He just wasn't someone who walked around a ruler in Israel. A ruler is a ruler over all Israeli people. You're talking about someone that even breaks past the Pharisees and Sadducees, one who has a lot of authority, one who knows the scripture, one who has studied the scripture, one who also has quite a bit of finances. And it says, a ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do? And Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? Now, you have heard that for years, and I've heard that for years, and we know that people can use superlatives and nice language and compliments and they're supposed to make you feel good. And I assume that this young man uh, who is rich and he's a ruler knows how to operate around royalty. And he's trying to make Jesus feel good, but he's also, he knows that Jesus is a teacher. And Jesus asked him the question, why do you call me good? Because him being a teacher of the Jews, he should know not to call Jesus good. He says, no one is good except God alone. Now, who's good? And who said who's good? And Jesus is God. And Jesus is the word of God. So are you good? Am I good? There's no one that's good except who? Jesus made that statement because there's something that he wants us all to know. And I want, we'll move from here from John to John uh, 10, 7, I believe. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 7. Because Jesus has just gave a revelation to this wealthy man that he want us all to understand that there is only one good and his name is the most high. But yet, a lot of times uh, we accuse God of doing things to us and holding things back from us that really cause a lot of problems in our lives, even death to our children and to our parents and everything and killing people because he wanted to teach us a lesson. Now, can that and a good God match up? You'll get the gist in a few moments. He goes on and he says, in, ten, in, in, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, So Jesus says to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, John 10.7, rather. So Jesus says to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So who was Jesus? The door of the sheep. All right? And he goes on and says, all, uh, all who 
came before me are thieves and what? Robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, now notice he says it what? Anyone. Did he say anyone? Rafts are anyone. A drunkard is anyone. A murderer is anyone. Who doesn't reach, uh, can, cannot be defined as anyone? Who is it that lives that's outside of the anyone? Nobody. So everybody is an anyone. So we, now we're looking at Jesus making a statement again that we're going to put it all together in a few, a little bit. That if anyone, doesn't matter who they are, prostitute, whatever, anyone, homos, homosexuals, trisexuals, bisexuals, what sexual? Didn't he say anyone? If anyone, <laughs> praise the Lord, I just love this. Enters through me, now you got to do what? Enter through him, not what? By him, but enter what? He will be what? Saved. And will go in and what? Out. And find what? Pastor. So he's going to find pastor in him. He's going to find pastor out of him. We read the same Bible. If you go through the door and you get saved, whatever that person may be doing in life, God's not going to curse him because they're pastoring in some area. We look at them and say, that person, and, uh, and, and God says you can tell the evil ones, but he doesn't tell you to judge them because you judge no man. Because only one has judged, and that is the most high. So he says, if anyone comes in through me, then he shall be saved. Are you all reading the same Bible? And we, include me, help Blame God for some things and sent a lot of people to hell in, in prior years. We won't do that anymore. I don't know, but I think they're burning hell. Are they smelling some smoke? Now, I used to talk about a lot of folks smelling smoke, but I won't do that no more. Then he goes on, and now look what he says in number 10. And let's look at read it in context. The thief, who is the thief? The devil. The thief comes only to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So it ain't God, and could not be God, doing what the thief comes only to do. Are we in agreement with that? So the thief comes only what? To steal, kill, and to destroy. So if my mama died at 32 and left 12 kids, God didn't need another woman in heaven who killed her. Sin. The thief. His whole everything that goes wrong in my life, the devil brought it on. Or it's a repercussion because I didn't do what I said consequences of my action. For the last few months, Pastor Lucia and I have been going through some things that I just keep asking God, God, what about this? What about that? Holy Spirit, tell me this. Holy Spirit, tell me that. And yesterday I was, when we were down here praying at 2.30 on Saturday, 
I had two visions sitting right there. And the first vision was a lot of wood and dirt, wood and dirt, wood and dirt, wood and dirt, and wood and black dirt and wood and, and iron and steel, just dirt, just junk. Wood and state, wood and stubble and nothing. It was just stacks and stacks of it. And I'm sitting there looking at it. And I'm saying, well, where's the light, Lord? Where, what's, what am I looking at? The Spirit didn't say one word other than the fact that stacks and stacks of things. And it was really nothing. Everything that had been in the world that was something, people, little trinkets and stuff, people, they were all stacked on top of it with them a dirt shovel. Everything that was of value. Then later on in prayer, maybe 15 minutes later, I asked the Spirit again, reveal to me what you're showing. He showed me the exact same picture again. Except this time it had mellow stacked, just like a, a, you take a chocolate cake or a four or five layer cake. Just take a ten layer cake. And it was dirt, mellow, all kind of junk, all kind of junk that we use as precious here, silver, gold, everything. Then another layer of dirt, and then on top of it, the same thing. And I'm looking at this. And I said, I still don't know what you mean. And he didn't respond to me even then. I saw it. Then last night as I began to study and pray again, he says, Ralph? I said, yes. He says, would you be here if I didn't put you here? No. I said, that's right. Then he asked me, how do you know you're here? And I asked you the question, how do you know that you're here? Then he goes on and says, and the reason why I want you to understand that, he says, every revelation that you get comes from God because nothing comes from the evil one. Every revelation that you get comes from God. Every revelation of knowledge. Anything you perceive and understand comes from God. Because as soon as, the, as, soon as breath is taken out of you, you, can you perceive or understand anything? And where you stack that? Back down there with the dirt and all the other stuff. So... When we perceive things going wrong, God is with us. Because the only way you can perceive things going wrong is when God tells you that the enemy is mucking with you. When you and I perceive things are going right, God's with us. Anytime that we learn anything new, it's a revelation from God because we're nothing but dust. It's going to take a lot of soul saving, uh, searching to understand that. There is nothing that moves or no revelation that can come or no lasting revelation other than when God's talking to you. Because the enemy comes only to do what? Keep, no, three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. He's only going to come to take what you have, to take your life or your relative's life, and to destroy whatever you go after. Your vision, your dream, your husband, your wife, your car, your washing machine. Everything that deteriorates is the work of the enemy. And God revealed that to me, and he says, now, I am love. And he says, also, remember my scripture that I sent to you. If you, being man and being evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to you if he asked? And so the Holy Spirit is God created power. It was a spirit that moved amongst the deep. It was a spirit that brought forth the things as Christ made them. And the Bible tells us by the spirit and the spirit of wisdom that all things were brought forth. And so we understand now that every time something is going wrong in our lives, God told us what the enemy is doing instead of trying to teach us a lesson. Yep. Or uh, it's the consequences of sin. Because we have sowed some seed and the crop's coming around. But God didn't sow the seed. God says, whatsoever man soweth, he should. And then he also says, what's your mouth saying? What my, what, Ralph, what's your mouth? What is your mouth saying? Because Jesus came and told us another thing. What every idle word. Have you read that in the Bible? And notice he says every what? Idle word. What about the ones that's not idle? Every idle word that comes out of your mouth, you're going to give an account for it on the day of judgment. And he didn't say in the last days. When it comes back to us from what we said, not the fact that we're going to hell, but we're giving in the what? Account for it. And not the fact that we sowed something that's going to kill us and send us to hell, but you got to reap what you sow. And so here, we, what, what God wants you to understand is that he is in charge. And there would be no earth and no world until he made it. There would be no man with a brain, a woman with a brain, until he made her. He made the man and he made the woman. There would be no thought process of breathing until he blew in the breath of life. There would be no knowledge because he is all knowledge. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, above all things get what? Understanding. And wherever understanding comes, God just visits you. And so you, you and I, if we just begin to look around every day of our life, every second God's there. And he sent Jesus to come to tell us that he came as a door for us to go through. And he told us what the devil came for, to steal, kill, and destroy. And I came that you might have what? Why? It's because he's talking to dead people. Jesus is talking to a bunch of dead people until he goes to the cross and pay the cross. They're all dead. And he came that we might have what? Right. And how often do we accuse him of taking life? Oh, that's just God's work. That's the Lord's work. Tornado came down and killed 50,000 people. That's the Lord's work. ISIS over there shooting and killing everybody. That's the Lord's work. The Lord has nothing to do with that. God right now is God of the living and not the dead. Isn't that what Jesus said? Let's think about this. He says, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it what? Abundantly. He wants you to have 
eternal life. When God say abundant, that you got more than you can handle. That you're going to live for eternal. And he's already given us what? Everything that pertains to life and godliness. And he goes, and he, Jesus goes on and says, I am the good shepherd. Now, the reason why we went to God, now we find Jesus identifies himself as what? The good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for who? The sheep. So we see Jesus as the one who laid his life down for you and I who were sheep who were made for slaughter, according to the Bible. So Jesus came as a shepherd, the good shepherd, not the bad shepherd, but the good shepherd because he came from the only one that's good, and that's the Father. Now what did Jesus do in his life that was wrong? Nothing. He says, I'm the good shepherd. And so we go through the door of the good shepherd. And I want to skip all the way down to 14. Yeah, let's go on to 14. It says, I am again the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. And that's where we have to learn how to know him all the time. We give Jesus a lot of credit when things go our way. But we don't give Jesus a lot of credit when things doesn't go our way. Well, sometimes, let me put it this way, for those who have been parents and have had children, that pretty inclusive of pretty much everybody in here, did you let your children have their way? You let them, if you had let them have their own way all the time, would they be alive today? And so God is, Jesus is a good shepherd, and he, and he loves us, and God sent us one who's going to usher us through this life into eternal life, and we can't always have the way we want it when we want it. And we know if we lose anything that God had promised us and given us, then we know that the enemy has come in and stolen something. And it wasn't another man or another woman or your neighbor. It was the devil. So he's our shepherd, and I know him when he comes, and you know when Jesus visits you, but he wants you to know him even more so. He says, even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. And I lay down my life, what? For the sheep. Now, God wants you, your Father in heaven wants you to know him like you know Jesus. And you know your neighbor and everybody else. He wants you to know when he comes. John, remember, every time you get wisdom or knowledge about anything, God has just visited you. Every time you get a good gift, God has just visited you and I. Because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Lord. And Jesus is the word, and the word's inside of us, so he and the word's the same, so both of them still there. But God visited us all the time because God says the world is mine, the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof. And as uh, the psalmist said, even if I go to hell, God, you're there. Where can I go to be away from you? And so let's stop beating up ourselves. That's what we don't want you to do. Don't beat yourself up for another moment. And that's what the Holy Ghost is telling Ralph. Ralph, don't beat yourself up. That's just wood, head, stubble. Because Jesus already died for you. You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And Jesus, I told, showed you in my word to where if I save you, no man's going to steal you to pull you out of my hand. Now, why are you going around feeling bad? Why do you feel like your life could be better than what it is when you've got the cream of the crop already? The grass is not green on the other side. Because I know the Father. He says, even if the Father know me, I know the Father. And he goes on and says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. And I must bring them also. And they will hear my what? Voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. And he meant, he was talking to the Jews, the ones whom he came to. He was talking about now the Gentiles. And we are one flock with the Gentiles. And he was talking about all that God saved through him. Every man, woman, and child was forgiven for the sins that Adam and Eve committed on the face of the earth by what Jesus did. And the only requirement is for God, from God, is that they believe in the works that he's done. Believe on Jesus. It's the only requirement. It has nothing to do with anything else. Somebody in here that. Because next week we'll be judging somebody else. And every time you judge, you have to realize every time a judge has a sentence that you give yourself. I didn't say it, God said it. Then Jesus says, Judge ye not unless what? You be judged. So when I stand in judgment of one person, I just judge myself for the same crime. You're going to do what you judge somebody else from doing. You can guarantee it's going to come back to you. Let God deal with them. He's the one that said that they're worth being saved. He's the one that sent his only begotten son to die for them. Now, who am I? I'm only here because he says I'm here. The day that God leaves me, I'll be in the same shape that Jesus was on the cross. Dying. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Isn't God a good God? And Jesus is a good saint. He says, you know, he says, for this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life that I may what? Take it up again. And every man and woman and child are going to have to lay down their life so that they may take it up again. Lay down a natural life so you can take up the spiritual life. In the name of Jesus. Now, this is what I like in 18. I got my name written up. It says Ralph. You see where, you see where it says no one? That says Ralph Moore had been taken away. And it says JT2. That's what he always over there, JT2. No one has taken it away from me. But I lay down what? I'm not going to ask God to die for me because he died on his own. I'm not, I'm not going to ask God to do anything that Jesus wasn't supposed to do because it's already been what? And he did it what? Voluntarily. And that's, that's something. One of these days I'm going to learn that. I'm going to learn to volunteer to do everything that God say do. I 
Hallelujah. Now remember, he's talking over there. Every word, idle word to come out of his mouth. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to do what? Lay it down. And I have the authority to do what? Take it again. This commandment, now notice what he said. This commandment I receive from who? My father. Who sent Jesus? Why did he do what he did? The father commanded him to do it. And we, we get to the other part of John. God so loved the world. God so loved the evil people. God so loved the ones who were sinning, shacking up, still love them. That he gave his only begotten son. Somebody going to hear Jesus. He knows how to get talk to them. He knows how to change. He knows how to change. So, let me put it this way. There are millions and millions of preachers today who preach the gospel, who's preaching the gospel, and gospel means good news. That's the word for good news, who have been major sinners, murderers, robbers, drug heads, crackheads, prostitutes, Oh, say what? Have been, but they're not still, but they have been. And you look at Paul, have been. Look at, Pe look at Peter, stone heathen, I never knew him. I don't know who you're talking about. Totally denied God. I don't even believe in no God. <laughs> and look at me. You're like Peter. Did I hear Brown too back there? <laughs> look at me. <laughs> he said Jesus to die for me. The whole world. And all I got to do is believe on a loving God that loved me so much that he couldn't stand to see me go to hell. That he saw me going to hell over 2,000 years ago and said, that's enough. I got to change to say Ralph and Lucille. I'm going to change it. Ralph ain't going to smoke. <laughs> Ralph ain't going to be running to run lies out of his mouth. I'm going to change him. That's tough. You're talking about 2,000 some years in, in the making that God changed me. Whew. Hallelujah. Now, God, I thank you. How did I change? He talked to me. He changed my heart. He changed everything about me. Because it was left up to me, I'd be just some of them old and so old they can't hardly stand. They see a party and looking at the party lights. I would be lost. Change me, Lord. Amen. He said, I received this commandment from God myself. And he is such a good God. Because there's only one good one. The Father. And our behavior will change. 
My next reference is go to John thirteen forty three. And I want to move over there, past Lucia, come move where she's going to thirteen forty three in the book of John. Did I say 1343? I don't see a 1343. Go back over there. Where was I at before? 10. Ten. Must have looked at backwards some kind of way. Amen. I don't know how we got that. We try to loop. But anyway, God has taken each and every one of us, and he deals with every one of us as sons. And if I don't find what I want to find in a second, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. I know that's where I might end up at. And Pastor Lucille will show you what she wants to look at. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 2 Corinthians. Taking my time, but my Bible just wants to me to rub it a little bit. <laughs> Let's look at five thirteen. Are we there? Second Corinthians five thirteen. For if we are beside ourselves, that means that I'm acting a little crazy. We understand that, right? If I'm acting a little crazy up here on this podium, it is for, for what? God. But for, for we all of a sound mind, it is for you for the love of Christ controls us. The love of God. And when I think about that, in fact, I, I, I probably think about that for a long time here. Just think about this. If the love of Christ controls me, Christ and the Father was the same. So his love had to be the same love of God. And God's love was the love that he put in Jesus. Right? And so we'll find here that the apostle here says that the love of Christ, the love of God, controls us. So God's love is with me 24-7. I do nothing outside of the love of God. My time's up, but I want you to think about that while I'm, before I move. So if the love of Christ controls me, that means I have no control of me. Doesn't it? And that means I shouldn't want any control of me. If I'm dead to myself and the love of God is controlling me, then that same love that God has and has to save every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. And when Jesus doesn't judge anybody, and Jesus says, I didn't come here to judge. I just came to save the world. So if I am here to just teach to Jesus, 
and the God that wants to save all mankind and that, that's controlling me, I'm going to have to release some things inside of me that may work contradictory 